Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Deborah Tubra. You are welcome to the Sexual Harassment Awareness and Prevention Training for Teachers. This course is sectioned into three modules with learning outcomes for each module. It's an estimated three to four hours of learning. It contains downloadable version of the GES guidelines for addressing sexual harassment in secondary education institutions. The course also includes a range of assessments to engage teachers. And at the end of this course, teachers will be awarded CPD accreditation points. For module one, we would be looking at understanding sexual harassment. And that builds the foundation for the entire course. Our learning objectives under this module is to ensure that by the end of the module, learners will be able to understand what constitutes sexual harassment. We also aim to ensure that you are able to demonstrate adequate knowledge of the types of sexual harassment and examples of the types and to identify the impact of sexual harassment on victims and others in the education environment. We also aim to ensure that learners understand what constitutes consent and what doesn't constitute consent. So now let's go into what is sexual harassment. So let's pay particular attention to what constitutes sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is any form of treatment that involves unwanted sexual advances, requests, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature. And for the avoidance of doubt, any conduct of a sexual nature that is unwarranted by an individual that constitutes sexual harassment. And also a conduct must be sexual in nature and be unwanted or unwelcome to be described as sexual harassment. So take note of the key words. The conduct must be sexual in nature. It must be unwanted or unwelcome to be described as sexual harassment. And it's important that we also go through the GES guideline for addressing sexual harassment in schools. So let's do a very quick run through the Code of Professional Conduct of the Ghana Education Service. And this code states that no employee shall directly or indirectly be involved in anything that may constitute sexual harassment of a people or student. So remember, we've already gone into the construction of sexual harassment, and by now you know what sexual harassment is. Secondly, the code also stipulates that any staff who has carnal knowledge of any female or male pupil or student of any age, with or without his or her consent, shall be guilty of professional misconduct. Thirdly, no staff shall under any circumstance show any form of inordinate affection to any pupil or student. And inordinate affection implies, that, implies the expression of love or likeness with ulterior motive. Fourthly, no staff shall have any carnal knowledge of any pupil or student in his or her own school or in any pre-tertiary educational institution with or without his or her consent. Now, let's go into the types of sexual harassment. First, hostile environment sexual harassment. 
this is unwanted sexual conduct that makes a student or staff member's environment unpleasant or uncomfortable. When an individual experiences these unwanted advances, which may or can affect them emotionally, physically, or psychologically, then their environment becomes unfriendly and hostile. Examples include unnecessary and unwanted pet names such as sweetie, baby, girlfriend, boyfriend, my wife, my husband, etc. There are also unnecessary and unwanted nicknames which are usually based on physical features of the individual. And some could be Brestina, Tundra, Bacaxil, Sexy, Atom, etc. Another example is intrusive sexually explicit questions or asking personal questions about a person's sexual life, such as their sexual preferences or how many times they've had sex. There could also be the spreading of rumors about a person's sexuality, sexual activity, or speculating about previous sexual experiences. Secondly, we want to look at quid pro quo sexual harassment. And this occurs when a person in a position of authority or power makes unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors or other sexual demands in exchange for some form of academic or job benefits or threatens negative consequences related to one's academics or employment. The third type of sexual harassment is retaliation sexual harassment. This happens when an individual encounters unfavorable consequences following their refusal of sexual proposition or advances, or reporting harassment, or aiding another person in reporting a complaint. So retaliation is what happens when an individual encounters unfavorable consequences because of one, their refusal of a sexual proposition or advance, two, they, they are reporting sexual harassment, or three, aiding another person in reporting a complaint. Sexual harassment manifests in numerous ways. It can be verbal, physical, visual or audiovisual. And in recent times, sexual harassment occurs via internet or in the cyberspace. So having looked at the three main types of sexual harassment, we now want to look at the impact of sexual harassment. And many do not appreciate the dire consequences of sexual harassment. So we ask ourselves, what are the impacts of sexual harassment? Sexual harassment can have very profound and damaging impacts on individuals, organizations, and society broadly. It negatively impacts the physical, psychological, and emotional well-being of individuals, reduces productivity, and undermines safe environments, and so on and so forth. So to summarize our learning so far, remember we've looked at what constitutes sexual harassment. And we've said that sexual harassment includes unwanted advances, verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature, which can occur in various forms. And we've looked at the types of sexual harassment and mainly hostile environment sexual harassment, quid pro quo sexual harassment, and retaliation sexual harassment. 
So we have also looked at some details of these main types of sexual harassment. And we've said that hostile environment harassment is an unwelcome conduct which makes learning or working environment uncomfortable, including unwanted nicknames, inappropriate questions, etc. With regards to quid pro quo harassment, we've said that it includes unwanted sexual behavior used as a transactional tool for benefits in with it being unacceptable, even if consensual. And finally, retaliation sexual harassment relates to unfavorable consequences one faces after refusing a sexual proposal or reporting harassment, such as social isolation or poor appraisal. Now let's go into some facts and myths surrounding sexual harassment in educational institutions. And first of all, we want to go into the facts and myths around consent. It is important to emphasize that engaging in any form of sexual activity between a teacher and a learner, even if the learner is of legal age and gives consent, is considered professional misconduct according to the GES Code of Professional Conduct. Carnal knowledge and inordinate affection, which implies the expression of love or like with ulterior motive as referenced by the code of conduct is unethical and inappropriate in all educational settings regardless of the age of consent or legal circumstances. In the context of GES educational institutions, consent does not equal permission. Consent does not equal permission Please take note of this. Now let's look at certain myths surrounding sexual harassment in educational institutions. And then we'll go into the facts on these subjects. It is commonly believed that a learner is capable of giving consent. But this is a myth. The fact remains that Engaging in any form of sexual activity between a teacher and a learner, even if the learner is of legal age and gives consent, is considered professional misconduct according to the GES Code of Professional Conduct. Carnal knowledge or inordinate affection, which implies the expression of love or likeness with ulterior motive, as referenced by the code of conduct is unethical and inappropriate in all educational settings, regardless of the age of consent or legal circumstances. In other words, in the context of GES educational institutions, consent does not equal permission. So there's also myths around dressing when it comes to sexual harassment. It is commonly believed that when girls or women wear revealing clothing, which is sometimes referred to as provocative dressing, then they are inviting sex or they are asking for it. And this is why they become victims of sexual assaults. But the actual fact is that the desire to exert authority over another person leads to crimes of violence and control like rape and sexual assault. The so-called provocative attire or even flirtatious actions do not necessarily invite unwanted sexual activity. Sexual assault occurs when someone is coerced into non-consensual sexual acts, regardless of how that person is dressed or behaves.
There's also the myth around female attractiveness. And this is commonly framed around the fact that only young or attractive women experience violence. The fact remains that sexual assault is a crime of power and control. Perpetrators frequently pick victims they believe to be the most open to attack and over whom they think they can exert control over. And so it's not just about attractive women or girls. When we have this myth, then it's easy for us to exclude children, men and boys, and persons with disability who are also sexually abused. Because they do not fit the stereotype of the victim or the typical victim of an attractive woman, others can decide not to report the assault due to the very myths and assumptions about what an average victim of sexual assault should be. We would also talk about myths relating to women and victimhood of sexual offenses. And this myth is framed around the fact that women do not commit sexual offenses. Only men do. Facts remains that men more frequently rape and sexually abuse women and children. However, women do commit acts of sexual violence against men, children, and other women. Therefore, believing and listening to all victims and survivors is important. The culprit always bears full accountability, shame, and blame regardless of who they are. Next, we'll look at the myth around yes or no. There's the assumption that when they say no, women frequently mean yes, but they play the hard to get game. This is a myth. The fact is that regarding sex, women and girls should always be believed, just like men and boys are. Everybody has the right to alter their mind when engaging in sexual activity, and only they have the authority to determine what they desire. So respect someone's preferences if they say no. Finally, we we'll would look at a myth also around the assumption that harassment will go away if you disregard it or harassment will stop if you disregard it. The fact is that it will not go away. According to research, ignoring the conduct is unsuccessful since harassers typically do not seize on their own. Moreover, ignoring such behavior can even be interpreted as support or encouragement. Therefore, harassment must be stopped. And so we have looked through the myths, and it's important for us to know that these myths are not real, and they must not be used as excuses for harassment. We should take note of the facts around dressing that a woman, or is not justified to harass because one is dressed in a particular way, we should take note of the fact that victims of sexual harassment are not only the so-called attractive women, but children and others may be also victims of harassment. We should take note of the fact that when a woman says yes, she means yes. And equally when she says no, she means no. No, it's not the same as yes. We would now transition to take some fun assessments to 
see how we understand what we have been doing so far.